Coordinate Transforms. There is a whole lot to say about this topic. Somebody could easily make a semester course out of just coordinate transform. So I can't even do that justice here. So all I'm going to do is hit the key details and say what I think you need to know in order to understand and implement transformation optics. So it all starts off with a coordinate transform. And so we might have our original coordinate system that's just X, Y, Z. And we have some crazy coordinate system that we're interested in that is an X prime, Y prime, Z prime. And of course, implied behind all this is that somehow we have an equation to calculate X prime given X, Y, Z, and that we can calculate Y prime given X, Y, Z, and that we can calculate Z prime given X, Y, and Z. There is something called the Jacobian transformation matrix. That is a matrix that's very useful for performing coordinate transformations. And it's in the simplest form, it's defined this way. It's the gradient of the transform coordinate system. And then we transpose that. So the gradient of a vector, that's rather interesting. And it turns out the gradient of a vector is a tensor and typically we're taught we can't have a gradient of a vector. But anyway, we get this tensor, it's three by three simply because we live in a three dimensional world. If we ever discover the fourth dimension, well, our Jacobian matrices will then be four by four, but right now they're three by three. And we can think of the elements of this as sort of quantifying the stretching. So for example, let's pick a few of these. Uh, let's pick DX prime with respect to DX. So this means if we move left and right in our original coordinate system, how far left and right in our transform system does that take us? And if we look at the second term, uh, the partial derivative of X prime with respect to Y. And so this means in our original coordinate system, if we're wiggling a little bit in the Y direction, how much left and right does that take us in our transform system? And we'll do one more. We'll look at this one. How about this? So the derivative of Z prime with respect to Y. So here, if we wiggle a little bit in the Y direction in our original coordinate system, how much does that take us in and out of the screen? Boy, I can't really do that one, can I? Maybe I chose poorly, but you know, how much in and out of the screen does that take us in the transform coordinate system? So that's how to think of this Jacobian transformation matrix. The other thing I'll mention is that the Jacobian matrix does not actually perform the coordinate transform. That happened on the previous slide. Somehow we have functions that we can calculate our new coordinates from the old ones. This is something different that we use it to do some different things that we'll get into. And the last thing I'll leave you with that's sort of interesting, that here we actually have the gradient of a vector that very often we're told can't happen. And it turns out it's a tensor. So I think that's pretty cool. There's a bit more general form of this Jacobian matrix that includes some scale factors. And what you'll see is that there's a scale factor associated with the numerator of our partial derivative and one associated with the denominator. And we define that over here from our partial derivatives that are populating the Jacobian matrix. And what I've done is just summarize this for three different coordinate systems, the, the three that we most commonly use. And so for Cartesian, the scale constants are just one. And so they're really not even there. And that's why we presented the Jacobian matrix that way the first time. But if we're ever writing this Jacobian matrix in different coordinate systems, like cylindrical, spherical, well, these scale factors come in. For example, our H2 is going to be a row our H2 will be an R in spherical coordinates, an R sine for the H3 in spherical coordinates. So just keep this in mind. And those scale factors, they're defined this way. Most of the time we're working in Cartesian coordinates. Well, I should say most of the time when we jump to our numerical solution, we're working in uh, Cartesian coordinates and we don't have these because they're all just equal to one. But for example, cloaking, the big famous Duke cloak, 
Well, that was in cylindrical coordinates, and there's a row here in for H2, and so we do need to consider those scale factors. So this is the most general form. Let's have some examples of calculating a Jacobian matrix. Let's say we just would like to convert from cylindrical to Cartesian coordinates. So we're going from cylindrical to Cartesian. So we need some equations to do that. So we're going to Cartesian, so we need to calculate x, y, and z as a function of our cylindrical coordinate parameters, which are rho, phi, and z. Well, the easy one, okay, z equals z, that's an easy one. And this should be pretty familiar of how we calculate x and y from rho and phi in cylindrical coordinates. So what would the Jacobian be for this transformation matrix? So Here's how we would define our Jacobian. And now what we wanna do is go one term at a time and calculate those partial derivatives. So our first one, partial derivative of X with respect to rho. Oh, I'll mention one thing. Uh, notice there's no scale factors here. And that's because we're in Cartesian coordinates. Anyway, back to this, uh, DX D rho. So we wanna take the partial derivative of X with respect to rho. So that means we go up to this equation and take the partial derivative of it with respect to rho. Well, that's just going to be cosine phi. And there we have cosine phi. So now the partial derivative of X with respect to phi, and that's a negative sine phi. Now we have our third term, partial derivative of X with respect to Z. Well, there is no Z in this equation. So in fact, that term in the Jacobian is zero dy d rho. Now we're at the second equation. And so we're going to be taking the partial derivative of this with respect to rho, then phi, then z. So with respect to rho, we just end up with sine phi. With respect to phi, that's a rho cosine phi. And with respect to z, there is no z here. It's a constant. So the partial derivative is zero. And then finally, the partial derivative of z with respect to rho, phi, and z. Well, we have a simple equation here, z equals z. So the partial derivatives with respect to rho and phi, there is no rho and phi, so that's zero. And then of course the partial derivative with respect to z, and that's just one. So we can throw all that back into our Jacobian matrix, and this would be the Jacobian matrix for cylindrical to Cartesian. A second example, how about spherical to Cartesian? So the first thing is we need our equations to do the coordinate transform. So we need X, Y, Z with respect to our spherical coordinates. And these are the three equations and that should be familiar to you. Next thing, we define our Jacobian. Notice again, no scale factors, right? Because we're in X, Y, Z, these are Cartesian coordinates. So all those scale factors are one and we go one at a time. So our first element is the derivative of X with respect to R. So that's this first equation. And so, well, R is just out here. So it's just simply sine theta cosine phi. This is a constant multiplying R. That's our first element. Now we need the partial derivative of X with respect to theta. Well, now we actually have a sine theta. So a little bit more complicated. And so the derivative of sine theta is cosine theta. So we end up with an R cosine theta cosine phi. Now the derivative of X with respect to phi, and we have a cosine phi. The derivative of cosine phi is negative sine phi. So we have a negative R sine phi, sine theta, sorry, sine phi. Next line, now we're taking the partial derivative of Y with respect to R, then theta, then phi. So here's our equation for Y. And the partial derivative with respect to R is simply just sine theta, sine phi. That's our first element here. Then with respect to theta, well, the derivative of sine theta is cosine theta. So we have R cosine theta, sine phi. And then with respect to phi, derivative of sine phi is just cosine phi. And so we have R sine theta, cosine phi. Last line, we have our Z equals R cosine theta. And we want the partial derivative of that with respect to R, then theta, then phi. Partial derivative with respect to R is just cosine theta. Partial derivative with respect to cosine theta. Well, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So we have negative R sine theta. And then partial derivative with respect to phi, there is no phi up here. So the partial derivative is zero. 
And we can throw that back into the Jacobian. So this is the Jacobian for the transform for spherical to Cartesian. And that's really it. Now the algebra and taking these derivatives might get a little bit complicated for certain transforms, but it's really a straightforward process to construct this Jacobian. Okay, we have the Jacobian. We can now use this to transform vector functions. And we have these in Maxwell's equations, right? Our electric and magnetic fields are vector functions. So if we want our electric field in our transform coordinate system that we're indicating with the little uh, prime notation there, well, we pre-divide by the transpose of the Jacobian. So Jacobian transpose inverse times E will give us the transformed E. And we can do it the other way around. If we have the transformed E, simply pre-multiplying that by the transpose of the Jacobian gives us the field in the original coordinate system. So that's one use of the Jacobian, transform vector functions. Well, we have other things in Maxwell's equations. We have our operations. These are all the things happening to those vector functions. So operations, think things like derivatives, integrals, and our tensors, our material properties, our mu and epsilon. And maybe we're thinking, well, why aren't those functions? Well, yes, they're functions to us, but in terms of the differential equation, those are operations happening on to the field quantities. They're point by point multiplications that are happening. So those truly are operations. And this is how we transform operations using the Jacobian, no matter what that operation is. So let's say we have some operation F. Well, we're gonna pre-multiply by the Jacobian post multiply by the transpose of the Jacobian and divide by the determinant of the Jacobian. That gives us that same operation in our transform coordinate system. Now we can simply solve one for the other. We can reverse this and we can write our original operation as the operation in the transform coordinate system. Now we're pre-dividing by the Jacobian we're post dividing by the transverse of the Jacobian, and then we're also multiplying all that by the determinant of the Jacobian. And so we can use the Jacobian to go either way. So that's the purpose of the Jacobian. It makes, it makes transforming our operations and our vector functions quite easy. So here's a summary of what we've done in this video. We started with a coordinate transform and and this actually, a lot of times, is the hardest part. How do we come up with these equations that do this transform in a way that would do something useful for us? But we come away with three functions that we can calculate our transform coordinates from our original coordinates. Given that, we can construct the Jacobian. The Jacobian is not used to transform our coordinates. We already have those equations. Those equations are used to build the Jacobian, and then we use the Jacobian one to transform our vector functions, and two to transform our operations. And so in the context of transformation optics, these operations, that will be our permittivity and permeability. So that's all we're talking about for coordinate transforms. As I mentioned, this is a huge topic, and I really just wanna hit on the key points here so that you can apply this to transformation optics. I hope you found this video helpful. From the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for watching this video. I love hearing your stories about how these videos helped you. I also love answering your questions. So please tell me your stories and ask your questions in the comment section. I promise I will try to answer every single question that's asked. If you like this video, hit the like and subscribe button. I also recommend visiting the official course website that has links to the latest versions of the notes, the latest videos, and there's lots of other resources to help you learn, including implementations in MATLAB. I'll see you in the next video.